It's the last section of cardiology and one of the easiest peripheral arterial disease. You've got some pain in your legs when you walk and it gets better when you sit down. Well then how do you know it's not spinal stenosis? Because of the position of your body. When you lean back, spinal stenosis hurts worse. The causative factors also are the same as coronary carotid disease, which is tobacco, smoking, diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, but not family history. You see, peripheral arterial disease is not familial. So here we have the same things to correct and work on. But there's different answers a bit because for peripheral arterial disease, it's not just control the blood pressure, ACE inhibitors are better. Yes, significantly. So, patients have leg pain in the calves, it gets worse on exertion and better when leaning down than when sitting down, whether it's walking up hills or down hills, because it's a matter of the exertion, it's calf angina, and when it's very severe, the ins insufficiency of the blood makes your skin all smooth and shiny, you lose your hair follicles, you lose your sweat glands. This part is not hard at all. You should feel like, well, oh, yeah, I've heard that, I know that one. Pain on exertion in your legs, relieved by rest, stop smoking. Well, do you tell anybody to start? Is there like, A, smoke a little more, B, smoke a little less, C, start smoking? No, we always say stop. So when you have such bad peripheral arterial disease, extremely severe, it makes you lose all of the so-called skin appendages, and the skin becomes smooth and shiny because then hairless. So spinal stenosis, very common as people get older, when you lean backwards, walking downstairs, down hills, it gets worse. It's positional, and peripheral arterial disease is not. The best initial test, the ankle brachial index, which is normally greater, the blood pressure in your ankles or the blood pressure in your arms, which is normally greater? Well, they actually should be equal. Normally the blood pressure is equal when you're lying flat, and we don't do this test standing up, but if you did do the ankle brachial index standing up, your blood pressure would be higher in your ankles because of gravity. So the bottom line about this is, if you're lying flat, the blood pressure should be the same between the arms and the ankles, and if there's more than a 10% difference between the arms and the ankles, it means you've got an obstruction to the flow of blood. And that means the worse, the more, the worse the disease, the greater the ratio difference will be, which means 0.7 is worse than 0.9, which means if your blood pressure is 30% lower, it's more severe disease. And it follows proportionately that way, looking at what the differential in the pressure is to tell you the severity of the disease. But the major issue is, is the symptoms. If I said to you that your ankle brachial index was 0.7, and you go, yeah, that's fine, but I don't feel anything. This is why there's no routine screening for peripheral arterial disease. Number one, you should be telling people to stop smoking, to control their diabetes, control their hypertension anyway. So it's not that you will be doing something special just because they had uh, ankle brachial index as low. Number two, you don't get sudden calf death like you could have a problem with somebody who had coronary disease that you needed to fix, even theoretically if they felt nothing because it's not like syphilis or HIV where you need medications to treat it before you get permanently hurt. If you have a normal ankle brachial index or an abnormal one, and really the major issue is what's your symptoms? The most accurate test is angiography. Now angiogram, like for uh, uh, the aorta, angiography like with a catheter uh, angiography is generally not needed. We do angiography like we do for the heart to know sometimes where we're going to fix it. So there's no point in knowing the anatomy unless we're going to revascularize. And if we're not going to change the vasculature, there's no real point in knowing the anatomy. So the initial therapy, what's different is that Dual antiplatelet therapy is not a standard of care like it is in myocardial infarctions. What else is different? We have two other platelet drugs that are unique for peripheral arterial disease. 
Vorapaxar is unique for peripheral arterial disease. Silastazol is unique for peripheral arterial disease. We're not using Vorapaxar in stroke. As a matter of fact, we're avoiding it because it can cause bleeding into the brain, and stroke is a relative contraindication to the Vorapaxar. Silastazol is a one disease drug. Peripheral arterial disease, that's it. None of the others. So surgery is done to bypass the stenosis. If you're on medical therapy, you're on aspirin. Oh, what did we do? We added or switched to clopidogrel. So we switched to clopidogrel. We have the salazole, you stop smoking, you're using an ACE inhibitor, and you still have symptoms. Then we can either angioplasty it or bypass. So you have these, or these uh, uh, balloons for peripheral arterial disease that are really, really, really long that you put in a catheter and do a really long balloon to angioplasty of a peripheral artery. So Vorapaxar is an alternative antiplatelet drug specific only for peripheral arterial disease that can make you bleed in your brain. Why not screen? Because if you're asymptomatic, it doesn't matter. That's why. But then again, is there screening for coronary disease? No. There's no screening for coronary disease. There's no such thing as a screening chest x-ray. There's no such thing as a screening stress test. There's no such thing as a screening angiography. But there is screening for aortic disease. Why? Because aortic disease can have be, the chief complaint be you're dead. I woke up dead today. That's why we screen for abdominal aortic aneurysms because the symptom of their first presentation will be their last symptom. And that's not a thing that happens with thyroid disease, peripheral arterial disease. Oh, 5% of the population can get hypothyroidism. Yeah, but if you feel fine, it really doesn't matter. Symptoms are more important than the specific blood tests. So as with all major vascular disease, you're always going to say, I want to control the blood pressure. I want to control the blood pressure with specifically ACE inhibitors. I want to control my LDL. Everyone goes on a statins. There is no goal, but the goal is at least under 70. There is no goal, but the goal is at least under 70. Which means that if the statin doesn't control you, what's the second med to add? Ezetimibe, if the statin doesn't control you. And diabetes control, because the better controlled your diabetes, the lower the progression of your peripheral arterial disease. Remember, any atherosclerotic disease gets a statin, a high-dose, high-intensity statin. Cerebral, everyone gets a statin. Carotid, coronary, aortic disease, peripheral disease. That is the V in the CHADS VASC too. That's the V, so any of those things counts as a point towards needing you to be anticoagulated for your AFib. Do calcium channel blockers help peripheral arterial disease? No. One of the most common wrong answers is saying to use calcium blockers because it's easy to mix that up with like Raynaud's phenomena. Raynaud's we use calcium blockers because Raynaud's is vasospasm. This is not vasospasm, this is arterial atherosclerotic calcified lipid plaques in the intima, and calcium blockers don't help that. Calcium blockers help with vasospasm, Prinz metals. Smooth muscle spasm, Raynaud's. Smooth muscle spasm, esophageal spasm, but not peripheral arterial disease. Aortic disease hasn't changed one word in 25 years. The diagnosis of one for acute dissection, chest pain in between the scapula, differential blood pressure between both arms, and who needs screening? Not one change. So a 67-year-old man's in the emergency department with a sudden onset of chest pain. The pain goes in between his scapula. He's got a blood pressure in one arm and hypertension, and if you might say, difference in blood pressure between both arms. But here, even without saying in this case, difference in blood pressure, it says chest pain in between the scapula. Where's my EKG? Well, your question may very simply say, if they really want you to know the answer, EKG normal. That's one of the key ways to recognize that it's an aortic aneurysm dissection, the acute dissection, because you've got chest pain and the EKG and the enzymes are normal. 
why have you got that substernal severe chest pain and the uh, uh, EKG and enzymes are normal? Dissection. Now you see here how almost all of these have something that look a little bit right. Chest x-ray can show wide mediastinum. CT angiogram, magnetic resonance angiogram, TEE can all show the dissection and widening. Transthoracic, not so much. CT angiogram, well, CT angiogram is usually, can be, if it says, if they want you to know that it's of the coronaries, they'll say calcium scoring, calcium scoring. If they say CT angiogram without calcium scoring, it means to look at the aorta itself. An angiogram with a catheter is rarely ever needed to be done because the other radiologic tests do the same thing and much more easily. But you start with a chest x-ray. And you start with the chest x-ray because if you see the wide mediastinum, it's time to go to the operating room now. Now, if the chest x-ray is negative, and you see this, this presentation, then it's CT angiogram, magnetic resonance angiogram, transesophageal echo. So the aortic dissection, pain between the scapula, different blood pressures between them. Now the single most accurate test is an angiogram. It's just generally not needed because the other less invasive tests, like the magnetic resonance angiogram, the CT angiogram, and the TEE, are all about equal in terms of being about 95% sensitive and specific. Angiogram is the most accurate, but this is what we use. Now, if you're looking at your experience, if you've been thinking about what you've seen on hospital floors, most of you will say, well, wow, they're all equal. Uh, how come I only ever see CT angiogram done? That's a CT angiogram. How come I only ever see CT angiogram of the aorta? Because it's easier to get. Transesophageal echo, you need to have an anesthesiologist, you need to possibly have to intubate people if something goes wrong, you got to put a tube down somebody's throat, and an MRI is often less easy to get than a CT scan is. So although they're equal, we're just able to get the CT angiogram easier. In aortic dissection, the most important first thing to do in addition, of course, to making a diagnosis, the most important first uh, therapeutic thing is to lower that blood pressure so it'll stop the likelihood of the dissection progressing. So it used to be beta blockers, now it's beta blockers. And the answer has been the same for decades. Chest x-ray first, then make a diagnosis, also control the blood pressure, beta blockers first, then nitroprusside, and then a surgical correction. Beta blockers, nitroprusside, surgical correction, and it hasn't changed. Now, the more likely question for you is the screening question. You seeing aortic dissection, well, is much less likely than you seeing people who are just over the age of 65. Because every guy who ever smoked needs to get an abdominal ultrasound between the ages of 65 and 75 to exclude an abdominal aortic aneurysm. Smoking rates nationally for adults for the first time in the history uh, since we measured it is under 20%. And in states like New York and California, which have tremendous bans on public smoking, closer to 10%. However, 50 years ago, the smoking rates for men were 50%, 55 years ago. So if you see a 75-year-old guy, let's see, 60 years ago, he was 15. And when he was 15, he had a 50-50 chance of being a smoker. So smoking rates have markedly gone down, almost a percentage per year. But that in terms of screening, we forget how common cigarette smoking was, particularly amongst men. So half of all 75-year-olds were smokers, 40-45% of all 65-year-olds were smokers, and for women, it's much less. Women smoked at most about 30%. Men always smoked more. So remember also, though, it's for men to screen, uh, not for women. Women can go get a bone densitometry at the age of 65. 
Last couple of details in cardiology is simply for you to know what are the worst dangerous things in terms of heart disease in a pregnant woman. Now, if you look at this one, you say, mitral stenosis can be dangerous because you get a 50% increase in plasma volume and you become really symptomatic. Peripartum cardiomyopathy, why did we become allergic to our hearts? I don't know, it just happened. Eisenmenger's is a left to right shunt, which is not good, but at least it's not, it's uh, oxygenated blood and develops such severe pulmonary hypertension that it now becomes right to left shunt. Much worse because it's cyanotic, it's not oxygenated blood because you get bad pulmonary hypertension. Mitral valve prolapse and atrial septal defect, not so much. Okay, atrial septal defect, if there's a big flow problem, yeah, that could be a problem with it, but you can close it. You see, if an ASD happens that's got bad flow, you can close it. Mitral stenosis, if it's got bad obstruction, you can dilate it. But by, if you get peripartum cardiomyopathy and you get pregnant again and you have residual left ventricular dysfunction, you have a 70% chance of death. So that's why people who go around thinking that they can make laws banning abortion, even if there's a threat of harm to the mother, don't understand that the death of the mother is a three out of four certainty in peripartum and almost that much in Eisenmenger's. Because in Eisenmenger's, you can't handle the blood flow through your pulmonary artery because you've got pulmonary hypertension as it is. So you've got right to left shunting. Now you get a 50% increase in plasma volume. You're gonna even be in wor much worse shape. But peripartum with persistent LV dysfunction is the most dangerous thing. Why did you get antibodies? We don't know. The LV dysfunction is reversible in most people and does reverse in most people. And if it doesn't, you can transplant. You can also use the same medications you would in anybody with dilated cardiomyopathy, ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, mineralocorticoid antagonists, the same things that we've said five times. But the, and why can you use ACE inhibitors? Well, first of all, it's two things. Number one, it's after the pregnancy, so the baby's out. Number two, if it's to save the life of the mother, you gotta do it. If it's that dangerous, that's why you can use warfarin in the second and third trimester of pregnancy in women who have metal valves because the efficacy of warfarin in a metal valve is greater than the other drugs. Your key issue is here is that you can't balloon your way out of peripartum. Mitral stenosis is bad but you can fix it. ASDs could be bad, but you can fix them. Peripartum cardiomyopathy, there's nothing to fix. You can't cut or balloon your way out of this. You treat them as you would anybody else with congestive heart failure. Eisenmenger's, once you get that, that pulmonary artery so tight, you start getting right to left shunting. So what will happen in a pregnant woman is that it'll markedly increase the right to left shunting because it starts with left to right until you get bad pulmonary hypertension. But in pregnancy, if that 50% increase in plasma volume will become unoxygenated blood going from right to left. And that's why it will kill you with hypoxia in a pregnant lady, because that plasma volume will now become all shunt and you can't balloon it like you could mitral stenosis. So the two worst things, and they may not ask you to choose between them, Eisenmenger's and peripartum cardiomyopathy, because they're both bad. If they're both in the same question, you'll say peripartum cardiomyopathy, because you develop fulminant left ventricular failure. Cardiology is the largest section in the entire course uh, as a single section because that's the largest number of questions, which is justifiable because it's both the most common reason to be admitted to the hospital, the most common cause of death. And now is the time for you to remember what that letter you wrote when you applied to medical school about how much you wanted to help people and save the world and relieve suffering on this planet because if that is true, and this is your calling, then you will experience a great sense of endless joy 
at being able to learn so much and a sense of gratitude that you have step two, level two for you to study for so that you can help people. Because without that test, you wouldn't make the sacrifices you need to to be able to learn this amount. So if you see the test as good, pure, true, lovely, and helpful, you can't be frightened of it at the same time. And that will make you have a beautiful experience. Let the beauty that we love be what we do. There are hundreds of ways to kneel and kiss the ground, as Rumi says.